You people were vicious, violent, screaming, where's the wall? We want the wall. Screaming, prison, prison, lock her up. I mean, you are going crazy. I mean, you were nasty and mean and vicious and you wanted to win, right? But now you're mellow and you're cool and you're not nearly as vicious or violent, right? Because we won, right? And now you're sort of laying back, although it doesn't exactly sound like a totally laid back crowd, but that's okay. Drummers in America. Well, I'm afraid of Americans. I'm afraid of the world. I'm afraid I can't help it. I'm afraid I can't. With an impulsive, simple-minded narcissist like Donald Trump leading the most powerful nation in the world, it can be hard to keep track of the damage being done by his administration, and harder still not to tune out entirely. The president's constant lying and flip-flopping can even make it difficult to know what's true. He's repeatedly called the Iraq War a bad idea, but has increased the military budget and appears close to confrontations with Iran and Venezuela. He says he's pro-workers, but cuts their benefits along with their boss's taxes. Trump lies about everything. And that includes his views on cannabis. Fuck Donald Trump. Fuck Donald Trump. During the 2016 election campaign, Trump said he was pro-medical cannabis, but against recreational use. Colorado, marijuana, good or bad experiment? I'd say it's bad. Medical marijuana is another thing, but I think it's bad. And I feel strongly about that. Well, hang on. What about the state's right aspect of it? If the people of Colorado decide. If they vote for it, they vote for it. But, you know, they've got a lot of problems going on right now in uh, Colorado. Some big, big problems. A lot of bad information is coming. You know, a lot of people were all in favor of it. And now all of a sudden they're saying it's having tremendously damaging effects to the mind, to yeah. the brain, to everything. In terms of medical, I think I am basically for that. I've heard some wonderful things in terms of medical. Putting aside the fact that Trump thinks cannabis is both a medicine and a cause of brain damage, which is absurd. He said that he would allow states to choose their own cannabis laws. Of course, that quickly changed when Trump was elected. About a month after the president's inauguration, one of Trump's first appointments, Senator Jeff Sessions, was confirmed as Attorney General. Sessions may be most well known for his odd but relentless hatred for cannabis and its users. Psychologically, politically, morally, we need to say, as Nancy Reagan said, just say no, don't do it. There's no excuse for this. It's not recreational. Lives are at stake, and uh, we're not going to worry about being fashionable. This drug is dangerous. You cannot play with it. It's not funny. It's not something to laugh about. And, and trying to send that message with clarity that good people don't smoke marijuana. I reject the idea that we're going to be better placed if we have more marijuana, and you can just go down to the corner grocery store and get it. Give me a break. Jeff Sessions is to marijuana like Frankenstein's monster is to fire. As far as he's concerned, marijuana is a raging epidemic that's destroying America. During his confirmation hearing for Attorney General, Sessions said he won't commit to never enforcing federal law on weed, but that it's a problem of resources, not his long-held belief in states' rights that would hold him back. Still, even with Sessions as top cop, it wasn't immediately obvious what the Trump administration would actually do regarding state cannabis laws. Sessions soon made it clear, however. We are returning to the enforcement of the laws as passed by Congress, plain and simple. If you are a drug trafficker, we will not look the other way. We will not be willfully blind to your misconduct. He's gotten to work fast on cracking down on not only the illegal use of marijuana, but also on the legal use of it too. He's reinstated harsh mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenders, re-upped federal contracts with private prisons to put those convicted of drug crimes in, and asked Congress to even go after medical marijuana suppliers. Sessions has spent his long career attacking civil rights, voting rights, and drugs, especially cannabis, which he and other white racists perceive as a drug for black and brown people. He was even denied a federal judgeship more than 30 years ago for racist comments. One of Mr. Reagan's nominees is in trouble in Washington, in trouble for saying that the NAACP is a pinko organization and that a white civil rights attorney from his home state of Alabama is a disgrace to his race. Mr. Sessions is a throwback to a shameful era, which I know both black and white Americans thought was in our past. It's inconceivable to me that a person of this attitude is qualified to be a U.S. attorney, let alone a United States federal judge. 
Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III, he was brought face to face with things he personally had said. For example, that the NAACP and the Civil Liberties Union are un-American organizations. These comments that you could say uh, about a commie organization or something, I may have said something like that in a general way that probably was wrong. Sessions' history helps to explain why he and Trump get along so well. A well-educated black has a tremendous advantage over a well-educated white. If I were starting off today, I would love to be a well-educated black because I really believe they do have an actual advantage today. And there's much more. In the 1970s, the Justice Department claimed that Trump's real estate company tried to avoid renting apartments to African Americans. Several of Trump's former casino workers have claimed he gave preferential treatment to white workers. In 1989, Trump urged the death penalty for five black and Latino teenagers known as the Central Park Five. He said they were guilty of raping a white woman even 10 years after DNA evidence exonerated them. 23 years later, Trump claimed that then-President Barack Obama was not born in the United States. And in 2015, Trump kicked off his campaign with this. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some I assume are good people. KKK Grand Wizard David Duke, who recently said that voting against you at this point would be treason to your heritage, even if you don't know about their endorsement, there are these groups and individuals endorsing you, would you just say unequivocally you condemn them and you don't want their support? You wouldn't want me to condemn a group that I know nothing about. I have to look. If you would send me a list of the groups, I will do research on them, and certainly I would disavow if I thought there was something wrong. The but you Ku may Klux have Klan? groups in there that are totally fine and it would be very unfair. So give me a list of the groups and I'll let you know. I'm just talking about David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan here, but. I don't know, any, honestly, I don't know David Duke. I don't believe I've ever met him. I'm pretty sure I didn't meet him, and I just don't know anything about him. It hasn't stopped, by the way. In June 2017, the New York Times reported Trump said 15,000 immigrants from Haiti, quote, all have AIDS, and over 40,000 Nigerians would never, quote, go back to their huts. The White House pushed back on those claims. Trump and Sessions following a long line of racists who use harsh drug laws to target, arrest, and jail minority communities. Even if you wanted to give those writing and enforcing drug laws the benefit of the doubt that their words and actions don't actually make them racist, the results are the same. For example, despite similar usage rates, black people are arrested for cannabis use at about four times the rate of white people nationwide. In some states, African Americans are arrested eight times more often for weed. Whites make up 64% of the total population, but only 31% of the incarcerated population. Blacks represent 14% of society, but 36% of the prison population. Hispanics are 16% of America, but 24% of the American prison population. Less than one in 100 Americans are currently in jail. But for some races, genders, and age groups, that ratio is a lot larger. For example, if you're young, black, and male, it's closer to about one in four. That means you'd have a higher probability of going to jail than of getting married or going to college. But things move fast in the Trump administration, and with the White House's high rate of turnover, and the ease at which the president will throw even his most loyal supporters under the bus, it was only a matter of time before Jeff Sessions was gone. Currently, another prohibitionist occupies the Attorney General's office, William Barr. During Barr's confirmation hearing in January 2019, he said his Justice Department would not go after businesses selling state legal weed. But in April, after already having the job, he was less certain. Personally, uh... I would still favor one uniform federal rule against marijuana, but if there is not sufficient consensus to obtain that, then I think the way to go is to permit uh, a more federal approach so states can, you know, make their own decisions within the framework of, a, of the federal law. And so we're not just ignoring the enforcement of federal law. In August 2018, BuzzFeed News reported on a secret cannabis committee operated by the White House's Office of National Drug Control Policy. Known as the Marijuana Policy Coordination Committee, the group's agenda is to spread negative attitudes about weed and portray the drug as a national threat, regardless of contrary evidence. In October, the White House acknowledged the committee's existence. But how far is the Trump administration willing to go to fight the drug war? Trump is willing to build a nearly 2,000 mile long wall along the U.S.-Mexico border to keep out drugs and immigrants. But is he willing to kill? Some countries have a very, very tough penalty, the ultimate penalty. And by the way, they have much less of a drug problem than we do. The only way to solve the drug problem is through toughness. 
When you catch a drug dealer, you gotta, you gotta put them away for a long time. When I was in China, and other places, by the way, I said, Mr. President, do you have a drug problem? No, 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 we do not. I said, huh, big country, 1.4 billion people, right? Not much of a drug problem. I said, what do you attribute that to? Well, uh, the death penalty. <laughs> so, hey, if you're a drug dealer, and you know you're going to get caught, and you know that you're going to kill people, you're killing our kids. They're killing our kids. They're killing our kids. They're killing our families. I don't know that the United States, frankly, is ready for it. They should be ready for it. But at a minimum, you have to give long, tough sentences. But if you go to Singapore, I said, Mr. President, what happens uh, with your drugs? No, we don't have a problem, President. I said, really, why? We have a zero tolerance. And he's not playing games. These guys don't play games. You know, we have a different type of people. They don't play games. I said, how are you doing on drugs? No problem. I said, what do you mean, no problem? We have a zero tolerance policy. What does that mean? That means if we catch a drug dealer, death penalty. That's it. Throughout his presidency, Trump has praised dictators and admired how easily they enforced their will without the need for debate. Brazil, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, North Korea, Russia, Philippines, the strong-arm autocrats of these nations receive Trump's adoration. His Excellency, Donald Trump, President of the United States of America. One such tyrant is Rodrigo Duterte, who rules the Philippines. Since he was elected in 2016, Duterte has waged a brutal drug war that has claimed the lives of more than 12,000 people suspected of drug crimes. Hitler massacred 3 million Jews. Now, there is 3 million, there is a 3 million drug addict. There are. I'd be happy to slaughter him. In a phone call with Duterte, months into his drug war, Trump called the dictator a good man who's doing an amazing job. Trump said, I just wanted to congratulate you because I'm hearing of the unbelievable job on the drug problem. Many countries have the problem. We have a problem. But what a great job you were doing, and I just wanted to call and tell you that. He was quite sensitive also to our uh, worry about drugs. And uh, he wishes me well uh, to, in my campaign, and he, says, and he said that, uh, well, we are doing it uh, as a sovereign nation, the right way. I could sense a, a good rapport. Uh, uh, an animated uh, President elect Trump. And I said he was uh, wishing me success in my campaign against the drug uh, problem. He understood uh, uh, the way we were handling it. And he said that there's nothing wrong in protecting his country. High times will come Unlike Donald Trump, cannabis legalization is popular. A University of Chicago study found that about 61% of Americans support legalization. According to the latest Gallup poll, legal weed's popularity is even higher. And then you end up having 71% of Americans opposing federal government crackdown of uh, legal sales of marijuana. 53% of Americans in the same CBS poll say that alcohol is more harmful to the health. Just 7% cite marijuana. And so there's a bigger stigmatization of alcohol than there is on marijuana. Meanwhile, the president sits at a sad 41% approval rating, according to poll aggregates Real Clear Politics in 538. Also unlike Trump, in eight states, weed reform actually won the popular vote in 2016. When Trump was busy losing by nearly 3 million votes, while still squirming his way to the presidency via the Electoral College, California, Massachusetts, Nevada, and Maine legalized recreational cannabis. Also, Florida, Montana, Arkansas, and North Dakota voted to legalize medical use. Since then, many more states have also opted for reform, including Vermont, home to Senator Bernie Sanders and the first state to legalize recreational cannabis through state legislature instead of by a ballot measure. Remarkably, even though weed is federally illegal, about 95% of the U.S. population now lives in states with some form of legal cannabis. And despite anti-weed rhetoric from prohibitionists like Jeff Sessions, cannabis legalization is not harming places that opt for the reform. For example, according to Colorado's Healthy Kids Colorado survey, cannabis use among teens has been slowly declining since 2011. 
A study by researchers at Washington University School of Medicine also found a clear decline in youth cannabis use since legalization. Likewise, a decrease in violent crimes is found in states with legal weed. For example, according to a study published in the Economic Journal, cannabis legalization has significantly lowered violent crime rates in several states bordering Mexico by about 12.5%. More specifically, robberies have dropped by about 19%, murders by 10%, and assaults by 9%. Even with this progress and the obvious benefits of cannabis legalization, the drug war still rages on. Someone is arrested for drug possession every 25 seconds in the US, making it the number one cause of all arrests in the country. About one and a quarter million Americans are incarcerated for drug possession annually, while more than half a million are arrested for simple cannabis possession every year, more than all violent crimes combined. And despite having some of the harshest drug laws in the world, the US also has the highest rate of drug use on earth. In April 2018, Trump repeated the claim that he supports allowing states to make their own cannabis laws, but only after several state lawmakers lobbied the Department of Justice not to go after people in states with legal cannabis. While largely symbolic, federal lawmakers also introduced multiple pieces of bipartisan legislation to block the federal government from intervening. Republican Senator Cory Gardner of Colorado and Good member morning. of the Democratic leadership, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts. What we're working on is a bill that will let states make their own decisions about dealing with marijuana. When mm. state voters have stepped in, when state legislatures have set up rules, we think that's a place for the federal government to recede and let the states take the lead. Unfortunately, this type of tinkering will not solve the problem. The only way to stop the violence, arrests, uncertainty about weed laws, and unequal distribution of law and enforcement is to end prohibition federally. With Donald Trump and the Republicans in control of the executive branch in the Senate, that isn't going to happen. Next year, the Democratic Party has a chance to take back the presidency and Senate, and the consensus among most Democratic primary candidates is that cannabis should be federally legal, except for one. Former Vice President Joe Biden, who despite his anti-cannabis past, has said he supports weed's decriminalization and reclassification to a Schedule II drug with cocaine and meth. While he supports allowing states to legalize cannabis, he doesn't support federal legalization. Unfortunately, if early polling is to be believed, Biden may be the candidate to go head-to-head -head with Trump. Even though Hillary Clinton won the popular vote in 2016, a person as unintelligent and hateful as Trump should have been easily defeated in a landslide regardless of the Electoral College. In reality, Clinton's uninspired centrism, pragmatic incrementalism, and questionable progressive bona fides ultimately doomed her to failure. While still early in the primary season, it looks like the Democratic Party leadership and voters are trying desperately to repeat their mistake in 2020 with Joe Biden. In the 1980s and 90s, Biden helped implement some of the harshest and discriminatory drug policies in the U.S., including laws that still do damage today. In a 1991 speech to Senate, Biden bragged about his role in the drug war. If you have a piece of crack cocaine no bigger than this quarter that I'm holding in my hand, one quarter of one dollar, we passed a law through the leadership of Senator Thurman and myself and others, a law that says, if you're caught with that, you go to jail for five years. You get no probation. You get nothing other than five years in jail. Judge doesn't have a choice. Now, the fact of the matter is, we've gone from there all the way up to saying, under the leadership of Senator Thurman, and I'd like to suggest that I've take some small credit for it, myself as well, and others, the presiding officer, that there is now a death penalty. And we passed it a couple years ago. If you are a major drug dealer involved in the trafficking of drugs and murder results in your activities, you go to death. And a number of other severe penalties. We changed the law so that if you are arrested and you are a drug dealer, under our forfeiture statutes, you can, the government can, take everything you own, everything from your car to your house, your bank account, not merely what they confiscate in terms of the dollars from the transaction that you just got caught engaging in. They can take everything. We have laws in the last several years where we don't allow judges discretion to sentence people, flat time sentencing. You get caught, you go to jail.
Before that, in 1989, Biden even criticized George H.W. Bush, known for his harsh drug policies, for being too weak. Every president for the past two decades, Democrat and Republican alike, has declared war on drugs. And each of them has lost that war and lost it miserably. They lost because they attempted to deal with only part of the drug problem. They lost because they always did too little and they did it too late. That's why the Democrats and Republicans in the Congress got together last year to write the law that required the president to give us a national drug strategy. We don't oppose the president's plan. All we want to do is strengthen it. We don't doubt his resolve. All we want to do is stiffen it. The trouble is that the president's proposals are not big enough to deal with the problem. His rhetoric isn't matched by the resources we need to get the job done. Quite frankly, the president's plan's not tough enough, bold enough, or imaginative enough to meet the crisis at hand. In another speech in 1993, Biden described young, unsocialized predators that have to be removed from society. We have predators on our streets that society has, in fact, in part because of its neglect, created. Again, it does not mean because we created them that we somehow forgive them or do not take them out of society to protect my family and yours from them. They are beyond the pale, many of those people. Beyond the pale. And it's a sad commentary on society. We have no choice but to take them out of society. And the truth is, we don't very well know how to rehabilitate them at that point. Unless we do something about that cadre of young people, tens of thousands of them, born out of wedlock, without parents, without supervision, without any structure, without any conscience developing, because they literally have not been socialized. So I don't want to ask what made them do this. They must be taken off the street. Then, of course, there's the 1994 crime bill, written by Biden. The bill is often cited as a major cause of the nation's massive prison population. While former President Bill Clinton and others have expressed regret for their part in the legislation, Biden has not. Bobby Rush, member of Congress, said the other day, I'm ashamed that I voted for the 94 crime bill. You ashamed of that bill? Not at all. Um, and in fact, I drafted the bill. Biden was also against busing, a racial desegregation tactic, has been criticized for his role in the Anita Hill controversy, routinely supports legislation gutting bankruptcy protections, and voted for the Iraq War. In 2006, Biden was caught on tape giving a speech about Mexico and the drug war that sounds an awful lot like the White House's current occupant. I voted for a fence. I voted, like, unlike most Democrats, and some of you won't like it. I voted for 700 mile fence. The reason why I, uh, parenthetically, why I believe the fence is needed is not related to immigration as much as to drugs. I'm the guy that wrote the National Crime Bill. I'm the guy that wrote the National Drug Act. I'm the guy that wrote the law that set up a drug czar. But let me tell you something, folks. People are driving across that border with tons, tons, hear me, tons of everything from byproducts from methamphetamine to cocaine to heroin. It's all coming up through corrupt Mexico. Don't tell me in Mexico do you expect to get the same kind of treatment that we give other democracies and then you don't act in a democratic way? Not on my watch. Not on my watch. According to the DEA, Mexican cartels transport the bulk of their drugs over the southwest border through ports of entry using passenger vehicles or tractor trailers. Whether it's Trump's wall or Biden's fence, a barrier would not stop drugs smuggled through ports of entry, or by tunnel, by train, by boat, by aircraft, or by someone with a ladder. In 2007, when running for the Democratic presidential nomination against Barack Obama, Biden made a comment more racist than anything Trump has ever been recorded saying. I mean, you got the first sort of mainstream African-American yeah. who is articulate and bright and... And, and clean, and nice looking guy. Mm. I mean, it's, that's a storybook, man. If this is the best the Democratic Party has to offer in 2020, Trump will win, and probably deservedly so. Fortunately, there's still plenty of time for voters and Democratic insiders to come to their senses and nominate someone else. 
Bernie Sanders, Kamala Harris, Pete Buttigieg, Tulsi Gabbard, and Cory Booker all support cannabis legalization and other sensible criminal justice reform policies. Whether you personally think that marijuana use is good or bad, whether you would choose to use marijuana or not, the question is, should we really be sending people to jail and turning them into criminals for it? The answer is no. The fiscal impacts, the social impacts of our current policy are having devastating ripple effects on individuals and our communities are, and are only continuing to perpetuate the problem. This is an outrageous situation we have in our country. It is a prohibition that's causing the problems, as we saw with alcohol prohibition, uh, the violence that that caused, uh, the criminalization that that caused. Um, it's, it's far past time that we legalize this. And then that doesn't include the people that desperately need this for their, whether it's veterans, whether it's people with PTSD, whether it's people with things like Gervais syndromes falling into syndro uh, seizures. Our federal policy should be based on actual science and fact, not misplaced stigma and outdated myths. However, the fact that marijuana is currently classified as a Schedule I drug, the same category as heroin and cocaine, restricts and even discourages scientific research on marijuana, limiting our ability to create science-based policies. The evidence is coming back and violent crime drops, as well as actually revenue coming into the state. Even the evidence with severe problems like opioid overdoses, we're already seeing preliminary evidence showing that those rates of death are dropping in areas where there's legal access to marijuana. I'm confident that we're on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think this is going to be a long battle, but this, as you called it, a shot across the bow. I call it a first step on a longer pathway towards economic justice, racial justice, uh, uh, more public safety, and really co more common sense. Currently, Senator Elizabeth Warren only goes as far as Biden on cannabis supporting federal decriminalization and allowing states to decide weed laws. But if you're looking for the OG, look no further than Senator Bernie Sanders. Sanders calls for ending the war on drugs and legalizing cannabis. He also supports banning private prisons, eliminating mandatory minimum sentences, ending cash bail, and abolishing the death penalty, among other reforms. But unlike most of his colleagues running for the Democratic nomination in 2020, Sanders supported these policies when it was less popular. Too many Americans have seen their lives destroyed because they have criminal records as a result of marijuana use. That is wrong. That has got to change. Right now, marijuana is listed by the federal government as a Schedule I drug, meaning that it is considered to be as dangerous as heroin. That is absurd. The time is long overdue for us to remove the federal prohibition on marijuana. It is time to tax and regulate marijuana like alcohol. It is time to end the arrests of so many people and the destruction of so many lives. While Sanders reluctantly voted for Biden's 1994 crime bill to support the assault weapons ban and violence against women provisions, he vociferously opposed and attempted to amend its mass incarceration and death penalty provisions. A society which neglects, which oppresses, and which disdains a very significant part of its population, which leaves them hungry, impoverished, unemployed, uneducated, and utterly without hope, will, through cause and effect, create a population which is bitter, which is angry, which is violent, and a society which is crime-ridden. And that is the case in America, and it is the case in other countries throughout the world. How do we talk about the very serious crime problem in America without mentioning, without mentioning that we have the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world by far, with 22% of our children in poverty and 5 million kids hungry today. Do you think maybe that might have some relationship to crime? How do we talk about crime when this Congress is prepared this year to spend 11 times more for the military than for education? When 21% of our kids drop out of high school, when a recent study told us that twice as many young workers now earn poverty wages as 10 years ago when the gap between the rich and the poor is growing wider and when the rate of poverty continues to grow. Do you think maybe 
that might have some relationship to crime. Clearly, there are people in our society who are horribly violent, who are deeply sick and sociopathic, and clearly these people must be put behind bars in order to protect society from them. But it is also my view that through the neglect of our government and through a grossly irrational set of priorities, we are dooming today tens of millions of young people to a future of bitterness, misery, hopelessness, drugs, crime, and violence. All the jails in the world, and we already imprison more people per capita than any other country, and all the executions in the world will not make that situation right. We can either educate or electrocute, we can create meaningful jobs, rebuilding our society, or we can build more jails. Let us create a society of hope and compassion, not one of hate and vengeance. I have a number of serious problems with the crime bill, but one part of it that I vigorously support is the Violence Against Women Act. It's highly unlikely that Donald Trump and his administration have the political capital or the capability to stop the tidal wave of legal cannabis. Almost everyone living in the U.S. has access to some form of legal weed. But to guarantee the true end of cannabis prohibition, and to prevent a savvier anti-weed president from cracking down, legalization must be federally mandated. <laughs>